Can you start the recording? We are now live and uh, Alexei needs no further introduction. There are some questions on the Discord, which I, if Alexei doesn't object, maybe we can start with those. Yeah, we'll start with, let me go to the, uh, maybe uh, again, if some people, you know, whatever, missed uh, stuff, let me just again say just like a couple words where we are so that, you know, if people are like just waking up uh, and then we'll go with questions. So, um, um, right. So, um, so what we're doing is uh, we're studying, um, we want to uh, implement uh, strong interactions uh, between photons using this, uh, the following scheme. So we'll have a uh, light propagating through atomic ensembles uh, where uh, the photons will be interacting with atoms um, uh, using this idea of electromagnetically induced transparency that we spent you know, a full uh, lecture discussing. And then the atoms will be interacting with each other using uh, Rydberg interactions, which we haven't yet discussed. So that's what we'll start with today. And what we covered in the first two lectures was basically we uh, quantize the electromagnetic field to uh, understand uh, you know, what photons are, since most lectures in this uh, summer school are uh, about atoms. So we focused on photons a little bit. And then again, we spent uh, a lecture discussing uh, EIT. Uh, and now we're ready basically. Uh, um, to discuss, uh, to discuss the uh, Rydberg states, and then we will uh, put this together and discuss these interactions between photons in this last lecture. Um, but yeah, let's do questions. Yeah, so I think uh, Yakov and Grace, uh, maybe in that order, had some questions. And I know Vibhav and Matthew were also discussing, maybe, I don't know if they have questions or we're just, anyway, so Yakov, maybe you want to start things off? Uh, uh, yeah, actually, something I was wondering about concerning the, um... So the soliton dark state going through the basically EIT. Um, I remember that a three-level system, you forget about the photon, it has a dark state as well, right? Yeah. So in a lambda system, you yeah. you know, it's just in, you never go to the excited state. So yes. I guess what yes. you're doing is just moving this leg to the to the Rickberg state. But I'm wondering yes. whether these are connected in, in some yes, way. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. So that's exactly, I mean, it's it's exactly the same thing. So first of all. Somebody already pointed out, so there's no difference uh, until basically the next slide, whether we're talking about a, like a lambda system, we're going one, two, three, uh, uh, sorry, a ladder system, one, two, three, or a lambda system like that. So uh, it doesn't matter. So the physics is the same. That's the first point. And the second point is that, yes. So, uh, you know, when you study, um, when you study EIT with a classical light, um, you know, uh, that's exactly what, you know, um, how you explain EIT, you know, you form a, uh, um, a superposition between the ground state and that third state, you know, and this gives you this uh, um, a propagation. Um, now, in the case of, uh, um, right, and then you can think about the problem we're studying, um, the equations rather that we're studying in previous lectures, you can think about them in two ways, as I said. One is you can, um, um, that's the way I set it up. Um, you can think of them as equations for a single excitation. Um, and then the superposition is not between, you know, a, a ground state atom and the, uh, um, this uh, R atom. It's a superposition between a uh, photonic excitation on top of the ground state and the R atom, uh, which is again, excited from the ground state. So, but it's exactly the same idea, same superposition. I mean, everything is very similar. And now, as I said, these equations are actually are the same equations that you would write down for coherent light propagating. So I wrote equations for the envelope of a single photon, but we could also have been studying equations for, you know, coherent pulses propagating. And for these coherent pulses, it will be exactly what you said. So for, it will be exactly, we'll be forming now superpositions between G and R. Uh, and this superposition would be the one that will give you a destructive interference for the excitation to E. So uh, it'll be identical. So things are just a little bit more confusing because we're talking about the single photon. So there's an extra quantum degree of freedom. So the superposition is between a, uh, a photonic excitation, and atomic excitation. But, uh, but it's identical uh, to what you said. It's exactly the dark state. Everything is the same. Yes. Very good. Okay, great, thanks. So Grace, I think you also had a question. Um, yeah, I think there might've been an answer in the Discord, but I'll, I'll still ask it, which is just, so 
I think our original reasoning for having this detuning was to avoid occupying this excited state E because it has it has scattering and loss. But then we saw with the three level medium that at omega equals zero, at least we we get a dark state regardless of the detuning. So I guess my question was like, why bother to detune? Yeah, very good question. Right. So as I will so hopefully get to uh, today, so uh, we will consider both scenarios. They're both interesting. That's and that's why we discussed them before. Uh, they're both interesting with uh, zero delta and small delta. Um, so basically, um, like the way the way we're what we're going to it'll be the rest of the lecture. So if what I'm going to say now doesn't make sense, that's okay. I mean that's exactly what we'll spend the entire lecture discussing. But the way these um, interactions between photons are going to be working is that uh, uh, one of the photons will basically be destroying EIT for the other photon. And that's how they're gonna be interacting with each other. And so uh, when delta is equal to zero and one photon destroys EIT for the other photon, uh, the other photon just scatters because uh, you know now it sees this resonant two level medium. On the other hand, uh, if we're in large delta limit, if one photon destroys EIT for the other photon, um, you just uh, change the phase uh, that the second photon uh, acquires. So uh, this will be the difference between dissipative interactions between photons and uh, and dispersive or unitary interactions between photons. But this, uh, but if this doesn't make sense, it's okay. I mean, and if it if it does make perfect sense, then maybe uh, you already understand everything that I'm going to talk about today. So that's the only thing we'll discuss today. Uh, exactly that uh, difference. Um. So. Maybe a follow-up question then, does it, it, it um, one person had suggested that maybe it was because if you have like omega not equal to zero, then uh, for, for like delta large, you can avoid populating this excited state, but for like uh, a small delta, you will immediately start populating the excited state um, for omega not equal to zero. Uh, is that at all related to the comment you just made or? I'm not sure I understand. I'm not sure. Can, can you repeat that again? Actually, I don't think I understand. Uh, uh, let so me go back the, maybe to a picture. Let me go to a picture so that we're looking at the same thing. Um, yeah, I think that's a picture. Yeah. Okay, say it again now. Yeah, so I mean like the way we got the dark state was for omega equal to zero. Um, this the, capital, sorry. capital omega. Uh, right? the, no, no, sorry, little omega. The Little omega. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, like we just plugged in little omega equal to zero and we got um, that there was yes. no occupation in the in the excited state. But yes. if we have like omega on the order of the detuning or greater. Um, Which omega? The little then, omega again? Yes, sorry, always little omega. Um, okay. uh, if we have little omega like greater than the detuning, then um, will you start to excite the, like the E state? Um, yes, yes. So whenever, problem? yeah, and this is this is true for both, uh, you know, for both uh, zero delta and non-zero delta. Whenever this little omega is non-zero, you don't have a perfect dark state. So that's true in both cases. And in fact, the situation is uh, worse uh, with large delta um, uh, than with zero delta. Because it turns out that kind of this window over which um, the, um, I mean, this Gaussian part that I discussed is the same in both cases. But if you just uh, try to decide, you know, how far away do you need to go for, um, you know, for um, to see like huge uh, absorption. I mean, it turns out that the window uh, over which uh, this um, uh, little omega doesn't matter is smaller at large de delta than at small delta. So it's actually a little bit the other way around, in fact. So large delta is sort of uh, uh, gives you EAT that's a little bit uh, less robust uh, in some sense, um, but I'm not gonna get into that. Um, so so large delta doesn't, I mean, what, right. So, okay, so what, um, um, uh, yeah, this, there's a lot of, there are a lot of details here. Um, so how should I say that? Um, I mean, maybe I need to start drawing. Maybe we need to set this up, uh, but I'll try to say it in words. Um, so if you have a large delta, one way to look at this, let's suppose this delta is larger than omega. Um, 
Then what you can do is you can diagonalize this two level system ER and you get two dress states, you know, uh, one like R prime, um, uh, which is shifted by a Stark shift omega squared over delta from R up. And the other one state is E prime, which is shifted by omega squared over delta from the E state down. Um, and uh, basically uh, what, what can happen now is that um, if this omega is actually equal to omega squared over delta, we will hit, we will resonantly hit, you know, the stark shifted state R prime. Uh, and that's bad uh, because there you get, you know, large absorption. So, and this is the, it's, it's uh, this Raman absorption peak. So uh, um, it's true, it's true that uh, you have this large delta, but it turns out that just omega squared over delta away from omega, so this capital omega squared over delta away from little omega equal to zero, you just shift by a little bit, capital omega squared over delta, it could be a small number. You get this huge absorption. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so it's a kind of a, uh, um, so the EIT, it's not true that the EIT works better with large delta, large delta rather than with small delta. What works better with large delta is the case when you turn off this capital omega. So we turn off the capital omega, then this large delta is all important. Um, without it, you have scattering. With it, you just get a picked up phase. But with omega turned on, large delta is, uh, is uh, not necessarily a good thing. Does that help? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Okay. Okay, more questions, Kate. You said there were some other discussions that you were not sure were questions or discussions. Anybody else have questions? No? Okay. Okay, well then let's uh, let's get going and feel free to interrupt anytime. So, uh, um, okay. So we covered uh, photons, we covered EIT, and now we'll cover Rydberg states and now we'll connect them together. Um, okay, so, uh, and Rydberg states, um, you know, uh, they were covered by uh, Antoine Brouet's um, uh, and Caden might or might not cover them. And there might also be, or might have been mentions of them, uh, uh, by Adam and Wasim. So, uh, so you already know by Rydberg state, so I'm not gonna have a detailed lecture on them. It'll be very, very simple uh, and actually uh, with pretty pictures. Um, so Rydberg atoms. So this is all gonna be a cartoon. Um, um, so let's uh, uh, consider electronic energy levels uh, in an atom where the ground state, you know, for simplicity has here principal quantum number n equal to one. Um, and then this is the cartoon of the uh, ground state electronic wave function centered around the nucleus, the cartoon. Um, and then uh, photons can be used to excite atoms to uh, you know, excited electronic states. That's what we've been talking about. And then as we excite to larger and larger principal quantum numbers, this wave function grows uh, and it keeps growing as we increase the principal quantum number. Um, and then the Rydberg states are just these states all the way up here at the top um, uh, that have a large principal quantum number, such as, for example, principal quantum number n equals 100. So that's pretty typical. Um, and they have very large size. Um, in fact, the size scales as the, um, as the square of the principal quantum number. Um, so while the ground state uh, can be, say, a tenth of a nanometer in size, the uh, n equals 100 Rydberg state, you know, um, when you square it here, um, um, can be, uh, you know, four orders of magnitude bigger. So, so a micron. And four orders of magnitude is, is a lot. So, uh, uh, and here's a kind of a, uh, uh, an analogy. So uh, this is like a, a Google map of the University of Maryland campus. Uh, and let's suppose that the n equals one uh, ground state is the size of this uh, physical sciences complex where a lot of the uh, labs of the uh, JQI are, are, are located. So then if you uh, consider something that has a radius uh, that's 10 to the four times uh, um, larger, that's actually, you know, like a, kind of a non-negligible fraction of the United States. So uh, it's, it's huge. So these Rydberg atoms are really, really huge. Um, 
And now, because they have such huge size, scaling is n squared. So you can think of this uh, negatively charged electron that's sort of far from the positively charged nucleus. And this is uh, the definition of the huge electric dipole moment. And because of this, you get strong distant interactions between Rydberg states. Now, this is all very naive, but maybe let me unpack this just a little bit and then I'll pause for questions. Um, so the thing that is really huge here is the transition electric dipole moment. So if I take a two Rydberg states, um, N, that's the principal quantum number, N prime, it's a principal quantum number, and S and P are the uh, total um, um, uh, electronic um, um, uh, orbital angular momentum of all the electrons. So S is L equal to zero and P is L equals to one. So what's large is the transition dipole moment between these two states. So as N and N and N prime go higher and higher, this transition dipole moment increases. And now if we have two atoms, um, and suppose one starts here and one starts there, the types of interactions that uh, grow you know, dramatically uh, with N um, are, are these flip-flop interactions. Um, and these are kind of dipolar, one of our cubed interactions where the strength of this um, C3 coefficient is uh, proportional to the the square of the dipole moment, the transition dipole moment, because one atom is uh, undergoing a transition and the other atom is undergoing a transition. And each dipole moment goes as n squared, those, this thing goes as n to the fourth. It's huge, really fast scaling. But that's not what people typically work with. Um, um, what people typically do uh, is they consider two atoms that are both in the same Rydberg state. And that's what we will be considering. And then typically, if there are these two atoms in the same Rydberg state, they can't uh, resonantly, uh, you know, one atom cannot resonantly go to one state and the other to another state. There is usually a, like an energy difference. So this energy is slightly different than that energy. Um, however, what you can consider is this virtual process that the atoms first get to some other state, which is a slightly different energy virtually, and then back. And uh, if this energy is E1 and this energy is E2, the amplitude uh, for, for this second order process is given basically by second order perturbations theory. So you have dipolar interactions squared divided by the energy difference E2 minus E1. That's the energy difference between the initial state where the atoms are here and the virtual state when one atom is here and one atom is there. Um, so there's and a this, yeah, yeah, I'll just let me finish one sentence and then we'll, we'll, we, can, uh, we can do questions for, for a while. Um, so uh, if you now sum over all possible intermediate states n prime and n double prime, um, you get basically your van der Waals C6 over R to the six interactions and that's what we will be studying. And now let's do questions, yeah, as much as we want, yeah. Garrett? Okay, I can read this, right? So he, he, Garrett says that he, uh, he thinks the transition that moment scales as n to the minus three halves. Um, uh, I don't think so. I think it grows. I mean, you're saying it reduces with n. Um, maybe we're talking about something else. Maybe you're talking about some, some overlaps or something. I mean, it cannot, it cannot be a, a falling off with n. Uh, I mean, it has to grow. Um, so, uh, so what happens in this formula now C3 grows as like, uh, you know, um, N um, to the fourth. So uh, C3 squared goes as like N to the eighth. And now this energy difference, I think it uh, decreases actually something like, uh, you know, M cubed. So C6 goes as like N to the 11th or something. So uh, uh, it's insane. Uh, so the C6 coefficient grows hugely. Um, so Gary, do you want to ask uh, maybe, uh, I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure how this is possible. Maybe you're talking about something else. Um, okay, well, you could be right too. So, uh, uh, but, uh, but maybe, maybe it's something else. Um, yeah, I mean, feel free to, uh, you know, uh, if you uh, figure out later wh what that is. Uh, yeah, I don't think that's possible. I mean, the, uh, the dipole moment has to grow. I mean, that's, that's how this whole, uh, uh, you know, that's how all of this physics works because we have no, uh, uh, no uh, expectation value of the dipole moment in any of these states. So for this C6 to grow, we have to have these uh, transition dipole moments to grow. So uh, that's what all of this is based on. So I can't imagine how, uh, 
how it can decrease as n to the minus three halves. Okay, so more questions on this. Actually, this is the end of my Rydberg review because uh, you know I assume it was covered in detail. Any questions about you know what Rydberg states are or what Van der Waals interactions are? I mean, just to say, so what this Van der Waals interaction now means is that two of these Rydberg atoms, you know, uh, if they sit next to each other at distance r, their energy is modified by the C6 of r to the six. So there's this Van der Waals shift of the two atom state relative to uh, uh, two independent atoms that are far away. Oh yeah, good, exactly. Yes, right, so somebody's pointing out it's probably not the transition dipole moment between the uh, uh, two Rydberg states, but a transition dipole moment between Rydberg state and ground state. Exactly, exactly, very good, very good. Yes, exactly, 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 okay, perfect. Right, yeah, okay, cool. People are, people are on top of things, okay. So more questions on Rydberg atoms, uh, Van der Waals interactions. Uh, no, okay. Well, feel free to again interrupt anytime. Um, and so our goal basically for this lecture uh, will be uh, to figure out how we can map these strong, very strong atom-atom interactions with this huge coefficient C6, how we can map them into strong distant photon-photon interactions. And in Antoine's talk, you heard how uh, you know to make these strong interactions uh, useful for you know just the information processing with atoms. But now we want to take advantage of this and get uh, strong interactions between photons as well. That's the goal. Okay. So now that we've reviewed uh, um, now that we've reviewed uh, everything, photons, EIT, and Rydberg atoms. Um, let's now. Um, uh, just uh, again, uh, briefly revisit the motivation and I'll just show you a cartoon how this is all going to work, how we're going to map these strong atom-atom interactions uh, using EIT onto photon-photon interactions. Um, so this is gonna be very cartoony uh, for now, just to get, get you the basic idea. And then we'll get into some formulas. Um, so consider a cloud of ground state atoms and suppose there are two photons that are incident uh, on this cloud. Um, now, as one photon uh, enters the medium, it drags along a Rydberg excitation uh, and then exits the medium. So the way it drags along a Rydberg excitation is precisely this physics of dark state polaritons that we talked about. So the photon goes in, it drags along that Rydberg excitation, which I showed as, a, as this uh, orange circle, and then it exits the medium. Um, okay. So now, um, Let's see it again, and then let's pause it. So we pause this photon inside the medium, or maybe it's still going, but I just want to uh, keep looking at it, so I don't want it to exit. Um, so the photon drags along a Rydberg excitation uh, shown by this orange circle. Now the second photon also goes into the medium, form this polariton that has a, you know, a Rydberg component shown by this orange circle. Um, and now, um, we know that these uh, Rydberg excitations, they feel strong distant interactions. That's this Van der Waals interaction that we just discussed. But this Rydberg excitation, you know, it's part of this dark state polariton. Uh, so these dark state polaritons, these photons now start interacting with each other because of that. So, um, um, right. And just to repeat, you know, because they have a photonic component, they move. Uh, although slowly with this reduced group velocity. And because they have a Rydberg excitation component, they interact. So we now got photons that move and interact. Um, okay, good. So Jeremy is helping out here with the, uh, with the scaling. Thank you, Jeremy. So, uh, okay, so this is the basic idea, um, right? So because Rydberg excitations feel strong distant uh, interactions, we also get strong distant interactions between photons. So, uh, and this was very hand wavy, and now we're gonna dive into, into, into more detail. So any uh, questions on this hand waving picture? And I'm sure there are questions, but uh, you know, we will answer them. Um, but you can ask now if you want. Maybe I'll punt until I get to the formulas. But is the basic picture sort of clear? Okay. 
Good. Okay. So, um, so now, um, um, what we'll do, uh, and maybe that's the only thing actually we're going to do, we probably won't have time for, for these other uh, parts, which is fine. Um, they're not really necessary. Um, it's much easier actually to understand what's going on is instead of having, instead of fully describing the, uh, the math uh, behind uh, this uh, intuition that I showed where you have these two moving photons, it's actually much easier to study the problem where you have a stationary with Rydberg excitation uh, and the polariton interacts with it. The math is much simpler. The explanation is much simpler, uh, but it really completely covers the intuition for the case where both photons are moving. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to now study probably for the rest of the lecture, the situation where a photon or a polariton is interacting with a stationary excitation, uh, but it will give us all the intuition we want, we need. Okay. So photon interacting with a stationary excitation, stationary Rydberg excitation. So this is our medium. Um, and uh, let us have two different Rydberg states, R and R prime. Uh, here they are. Um, and let's suppose a photon is coming in in our favorite you know, uh, EIT configuration. And now finally, it's going to be important that R is the Rydberg state. So before it didn't matter, but now it's going to be a Rydberg state. And let's suppose we have a single atom somewhere inside the medium at position Z0 um, that's prepared in the state R prime. So all the atoms are in the ground state, except one atom is excited to the Rydberg state R prime. Um, you know, we could have maybe, uh, maybe this is, this is an experiment, uh, you know, that Antoine runs where he's able to excite a single atom, a particular atom to the state R prime. So that's the assumption. And then we want to see, uh, you know, we already know what happens to this photon uh, without this R prime atom. That's what we uh, explained in the previous lecture. But now we want to know what happens to this photon in the presence of this extra, you know, uh, R prime excitation. How does it modify the physics of the, of the uh, EIT? So, uh, you know, as we uh, introduced this uh, atom in R, um, uh, so atoms in R now experience a van der Waals uh, interaction with the uh, atoms in R, with the atom in R prime. Now this atom in R prime is just fixed. So it's sitting there. So what it does, it just, uh, it gives a potential uh, for the atoms in state R, in, uh, in a state R uh, that uh, depends uh, on the distance between uh, the R atom at position Z and the R prime atom at position uh, Z zero. So like this, so the, uh, the energy of the state R now depends on how close this R atom is to the Z zero, uh, to Z zero. If it's far away, then this is zero. And if it's close, it's really this uh, one of R to the six and it's huge. Um, so this energy of the R atom is now spatially dependent. Okay, so this means that far away from the Z zero atom, you know, this one of R to the six is negligible. Um, and uh, this is basically almost zero and we get our favorite transparent EIT uh, medium that we discussed. However, next to the Z zero atom, uh, this shift is large. Um, and uh, it can be so large that this omega basically becomes negligible. I mean, it doesn't do anything. Omega couples to nothing. The state R is shifted away to infinity. Um, and so then uh, near the Z0 atom, we effectively have a resonant two-level medium, absorbing resonant two-level medium. Um, and so when the photon goes in, it first goes through this uh, transparent EIT medium, but then it gets to this uh, absorbing two-level medium and it gets scattered. Um, so, uh, so what happened, right, is that this R prime excitation caused uh, the scattering uh, of this incoming photon um, in an otherwise transparent EAT medium. Um, and we will discuss sort of in the following slide that the size uh, of this uh, absorbing uh, two-level medium um, is given by what we call the block A radius, the Rydberg block A radius RB, which I'm going to define. So is the basic... Um, Yes. Is, is the sort of geometry of the scattering, is, is it like you'd have for a normal two-level system or is it modified by this medium? 
like the direction of the scattered wave? Um, it's in it's in a, it's in four pi. Yeah. So symmetric for. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not. I mean, it's never symmetric. You know, there's some dipole pattern. You know, it depends on your polarization. Pattern. Yeah. It's usually. I mean, the scattering happens through this gamma, right? And gamma, you know, is just this single atom, um, you know, decay that's into four pi, you know, with some, uh, you know, um, some funny uh, dipolar pattern. Um, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Just, just a clarification question. Um, so, yeah. R prime is is R and R R and R prime the same state or? Ah, very good question. Yeah. So I assume that they're different. Um, and that's why I drew this R prime a little bit lower than R, you know, it's some different Rydberg state. And the reason I want to do this is I want to make sure that if I prepare an atom in the state R prime, and then I shine this classical light omega on it, and then I send the single photon on it, I want to make sure that nothing happens to it. I want to make sure that it gets, you okay. know, it doesn't move. I want to make sure that's a stationary excitation that I can just treat as a creating a potential for the state R. So it's no longer like a quantum object, really. Um, um, okay. So, yeah, so that's on purpose to simplify okay. the picture. Yes. I see. So, so basically, it's like maybe we need the modified C six instead of like the C six we get when we have like two. Yes. Six. Yes. Exactly. Okay. So this is a okay, C six. Cool. This is a C six interaction between R and R prime. But okay. the way you derive it is in exactly the same way. You uh, you know, consider these two atoms, then they do some virtual thing, and then they come back. So uh, mm. the derivation is the same, but it's indeed a C six coefficient between two different Rydberg states. Very good, very good. Okay. Yeah, I totally uh, shoved it into the rug. Excellent, yeah. thanks for paying attention. Yeah, thank you. More questions? These are great questions, both Caden and uh, Tian Ru. Excellent. And thank you, Caden. You know, notice Caden, as is every time, you're a pro, uh, you know, uh, until you ask the question, nobody's asking questions and then you go for it and, uh, and everybody asks, that's great. And I'll, okay. Then I'll ask another. Do the R and R prime have to be uh, different? Uh, the, sorry, the same angular, or there shouldn't be a transition matrix dipole between R and R prime? Yeah. Well, so um, yes, exactly. You don't want you don't want a situation where you know uh, you have this R excitation that's created uh, by this polariton, and then there's this R prime atom. Then you get a more complicated thing. You know, they start flip flopping, which is actually a very very fun problem. So uh, I'll. Briefly, yeah, actually, I probably won't get to it. Uh, but uh, you know, there's this famous uh, two photon gate that's uh, based on these Rydberg polaritons that uh, that Misha and Vladen did. The first author is actually James Thompson, uh, Jeff Thompson, um, and uh, they exactly do that. So uh, they have a one excitation prepared in a p state, and then an s polariton goes by, and uh, they like go by using this flip flop. It's really cool. Uh, like this, and this gate works like amazingly. And there's like a sort of a gate between this excitation and the photon. Uh, beautiful stuff. So, uh, but we're gonna not do these complicated things. Yeah, we assume they're both S states, for example. So uh, they cannot flip flop. Um, I mean, they can flip flop actually because your C6 interaction can have a, an off diagonal matrix sum, but we assume it's uh, small compared to, uh, you know, to the energy difference between them. Okay. Well, actually maybe what I said didn't make sense now. So scratch that. So, uh, uh, okay. So more questions. So, Actually, I have a very naive question regarding this picture. Let's say if you have many atoms in the radiable state R prime, so this this means nothing happens. Um, so okay, so let's see, nothing happens. Let's see. So first of all, I assume I have only one atom in R prime, uh, but let's imagine we have many of them. Um, yeah. So let's suppose we have an R prime atom, you know, uh, everywhere here. I mean, many of them, right? Um, so, so this means uh, this means that the state R is everywhere shifted by a lot. Um, so, what this would just mean is that uh, your entire medium becomes a resonant absorbing two-level medium for this incoming single photon. Um, and well, and that would just mean that uh, you know your photon will get scattered basically as soon as it enters the medium. Uh, it's not very different from what I showed. It's just there'll be no uh, there'll be no transparent piece at all just the entire medium will be an absorbing two-level medium. Is that what you're asking? 
Yes, 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 yes. So in the in the end, so okay. For now, we just assume only one. Let's say the red dot in the in the system, or maybe it's just a, only a few. Yeah, but but it, it's, it's, I mean, it's no difference. No difference as far as this problem goes. We assume that R primes are all stationary, and they'll just all shift the state R. So yes, we'll just yes. have a larger. We'll just have a larger absorbing resonant to level medium. Yeah. Are we good or? Botao, did I satisfy to her, to her? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Thanks. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay. More questions? It's a good question. Okay. Good. So, um, okay. So let's now try to uh, explain it uh, using our equations. Um, so these are our equations again for uh, the Fourier transform variables, uh, E tilde, P tilde, and S tilde. Um, delta is zero, so there's no delta here. And you've seen these equations like a hundred times now in the previous lectures. Um, the only difference now is that uh, this uh, the state, uh, you know, or this variable S tilde has now a shift that depends, uh, that's equal to this V. Um, and uh, that depends on the distance between Z, you know, the position we're looking at and Z zero, that's the fixed position of this uh, red atom. Um, and now we're gonna solve these equations, which are a little bit different from the equations we solved before. Um, and let's first solve them for omega, for this little omega equal to zero. So we're considering just the resonant light uh, coming in. Um, and then you can solve it uh, yourself pretty easily. You know, if omega is equal to zero, these are all very simple equations. So if omega is equal to zero, you can first solve for, uh, you know, uh, uh, S tilde in terms of P tilde here, basically something like omega over V uh, P tilde, you plug it in here. Um, then you solve for P in terms of E tilde, plug it in there, and then you just have an equation for E tilde, and then just integrate it over Z. And you get this, uh, very simple. So this is the formula. And now let's try to digest this formula. So suppose this C6 that's inside this V is zero. So suppose V is zero everywhere. So V is zero everywhere, then this thing is zero. And we just find that E tilde at L is equal to E tilde at Z equal to zero. Good. So if there's no red atom, which is the case where V is zero, we just get our perfect EIT. So that's the first sanity check. That's great. The second situation, suppose C6 is infinite. So suppose this V is basically infinite for all values of Z and Z that matter. Um, this is a little bit uh, similar to uh, what Botao was asking. So suppose we have maybe lots of, maybe lots of these atoms. And so we're basically, this shift is large everywhere. So if the shift is large everywhere, you know, we just take this V to infinity. So this omega squared stops mattering. Um, you know, this I cancels with this I, this uh, gamma cancels with this gamma and this V cancels with the V. And we just get, and this one over L and uh, the integral from zero to L also cancel. And we just get E to the minus D. And this is precisely, you know, the absorption of our light by a resonant uh, uh, two level medium of length uh, L, which is the full length of our medium and optical depth D. So, so these two cases are very simple. You know, when there's no uh, uh, red atom, we have perfect transmission, where the red atom is blockading the entire medium, uh, we get resonant absorption that we've studied before. And now let's understand this formula in the general case where it's neither zero nor infinite. And then we have two regimes. So look at this denominator here. Um, for some positions Z that are, that are large, that are far away from C zero, this V is small. In particular, it's smaller than omega squared over gamma. Um, and then uh, this is a small perturbation to, uh, to this omega squared. Um, um, and then uh, if it's a small perturbation uh, to omega squared, then we get, uh, you know, we can basically set it to zero and we get basically EIT. On the other hand, if V is uh, uh, larger than omega squared over gamma, then uh, this term dominates and we can drop omega squared uh, and we get a resonant two level medium. So this is now the definition of our blockade radius. So uh, 
if we solve this equ equation, V of RB is equal to omega squared over gamma, solve for RB, this gives us the distance from Z0 um, uh, within which we have a resonant two level medium uh, and outside of which we have this transparent EIT medium. Uh, and this is what we already discussed. So the photon comes in, first it's happy, and then, oh my God, something is ahead. You know, uh, something just that turned my nice transparent EIT medium into a, you know, into absorbing resonant to level medium, and I better scatter, and it scatters. Um, so to just give a little bit more um, um, math uh, here, um, we can now define uh, the optical depth of this piece here, uh, this blockaded piece. So the full, the full optical depth is D. And now this is the fraction of this, um, uh, the, the, frag the, the fraction of the full ensemble that this uh, dark part occupies is 2RB divided by L. So the optical depth of this dark part, this two level medium part is a uh, D times 2RB over L. And this is the blockaded optical depth. And so whenever this blockaded optical depth is much larger than one, that's when the uh, Z0, the uh, R prime atom at Z0 scatters the incoming photon. Alexei? Yeah, sorry, this is so, so dense the slide, but, uh, but it's over. Um, Are you assuming the transverse width of this medium is small compared to the blockade radius in this definition? Yes, 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 exactly. So I put, I put all this under the rug. So I'm assuming a lot of things here. First of all, my entire problem is one dimension, right? And for this problem to be one dimensional, I indeed have to assume that the blockade radius is larger than the transverse extent. Uh, and, then, uh, and then I can do this one dimensional approximation. Excellent question, Caden. You're, you're on top of your game today. Uh, more questions uh, motivated by Caden's excellent question. No? Jaren, ah, right. right, exactly. Okay, Jaren. So, how did you calculate the blockade optical depth? So, um, so the optical depth for the entire medium is d. So, uh, and the entire medium has length uh, l. And now, what I'm saying is that I have a small part of this original medium. Now, not the full medium is resonant. I only have a small chunk of it uh, that's resonant. The rest is transparent. And the size of this chunk, uh, the length of this chunk, is two rb. And the optical depth is proportional to the length of the medium. If I make the medium twice as long, the optical depth increases by a factor of two. That's just how it's defined. Um, and so what I just need to do is I take my total optical depth, which is D, um, and I just say, which fraction of this total optical depth do I have now? And the fraction is just the, uh, the length of our you know, two level medium, which is two RB divided by the full medium, which is L. Okay, gotcha, excellent, okay. Thank you, Sharon. So uh, more questions? All right, and this is the figure of marriage. So uh, if, uh, if the blockade radius is so large and the uh, medium is so uh, dense that a single atom can blockade a chunk of the medium with a large blockaded optical depth, this is the figure of merit. And this is like this amazing thing that a single atom can now cause the scattering of uh, you know, uh, an incoming photon. So this is how now a single atom interacts strongly with this photon. That's what we're after. So we somehow, you know, use these tricks of this collective enhancement and this, uh, you know, Rydberg interactions to make a single atom uh, strongly interact with a photon. That's what that's what we were after. Um, Alexei. Yeah. Yeah. This is Leo. Uh, so you know, is it fair to summarize this that by simply saying that? You, you have electron EIT, you know, when there's no interaction and when there is interaction, that, that, that interaction energy takes capital omega, you know, the classical field off resonance and just shuts off the EIT. Exactly. By the interaction. That's it. Driving the system off resonance and That's therefore it. you back, you back to the, just the EG system, if you wish. That's it. That's exactly it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Very simple. Very simple. Thank you, Leo. More questions? Okay, yeah, sorry the slide is a little bit uh, dense, uh, but I tried to go very slowly through it, so I think people got it. Okay, so now let me show you how this allows you to make a, a, a single photon switch. Um, so uh, uh, 
so I will be using transistor terminology, uh, which has a, you know, a, a source uh, and a gate. Um, so using this transistor terminology, suppose that um, um, the source pulse uh, goes through the switch unhindered. Um, however, uh, that's what I want to have. So I want the source pulse to go through the switch unhindered. Uh, however, I want a single gate photon uh, to be able to completely block the propagation of the source pulse. So that's what I want to achieve. And I'll show you how the physics uh, in the previous slide allows me to do that. Um, like before I, this, uh, before I explain this, just let me motivate why I'm interested in this. Um, so, um, um, so since the, uh, the switch operates uh, at very uh, low optical powers, um, you know, it has nice applications in classical optical information processing. And also, interestingly, it can be used uh, as an ideal uh, uh, quantum non-demolition photon detector. So indeed, uh, if you, uh, um, just by looking at whether this source pulse is transmitted or not, you know whether there was a, a gate photon. So if there was a gate photon, um, then this intense pulse doesn't go through. Uh, and if there was no gate photon, then this intense pulse, pulse goes through. And this allows us to detect whether the gate photon was there or not without, um, without destroying it. So if we could construct such a switch, it could not only be useful for uh, processing uh, classical optical information, but it can also be used as a uh, uh, quantum non-demolition detector. And I will show in the next slide how the physics from the previous slide allows us to implement this. Any questions? No? Okay. So, um, right, so here's, here's, here's how it's gonna work. Uh, so we first uh, are gonna use uh, our standard, uh, you know, Rydberg EIT configuration to convert a, an incoming gate photon into a polariton uh, consisting mostly of this Rydberg excitation R. Then you remember this entire physics of EIT and compression. Uh, so once the, the polariton is inside the medium, we can turn off uh, this control field, which completely maps uh, our incoming photon onto a, a spin wave that consists uh, uh, of a single R excitation uh, that is spread across uh, the entire atomic ensemble with a spatially varying amplitude, uh, so which I will call here C of Z i, that is given actually uh, approximately by the shape of the uh, original uh, incoming photon wave packet. So now I turned off all the light, there's no more light. Um, all of the atoms are in the ground state, except for one atom that's excited to the Rydberg state R and the amplitude of this excitation, uh, it can be any atom and the amplitude of this excitation is a, uh, uh, determined by the shape of our original incoming photon. So we stored our incoming photon into this spin wave, into this uh, collective Rydberg excitation, okay? So any questions on the storage? So we, we covered it before, but many people forgot. Any questions on this? Okay, so we stored the gate photon and now we consider sending uh, a second photon, a source photon in this Rydberg EIT configuration that involves a different state R prime. And I'm sorry, I guess to make the analogy better with the previous uh, slides, uh, you know, I should have called this R prime and this R. So R is now a stationary excitation and our light propagates on the uh, kind of R prime EIT. So things are a little bit switched, sorry. Um, but Again, we have the stored excitation in R, and then a second photon now travels on this uh, three-level uh, EIT configuration involving state R prime and uh, uh, field omega prime. Okay, let me uh, pause and answer the question. So I thought a collective excitation was usually considered within a block A radius. Does the spinway extend over the whole sample because you're not sure where the excitation occurred? Uh-huh, very good. So on. Um, the collective excitation, this collective enhancement had nothing to do with the, uh, with the uh, Rydberg physics. Um, 
So um, when we just were studying EIT, um, um, you know, uh, that's actually what EIT was all about. You know, we had this photon that is moving and it's dragging with it a single Rydberg excitation uh, that can be in any of the atoms. So it's just the physics of EIT uh, um, that gives rise to this, uh, you know, a collective excitation. Um, it has nothing to do with, uh, with Rydberg. Um, but in our case, it happens to be in a Rydberg state. And until now, I haven't even, I haven't even, uh, you know, I haven't even mentioned the interactions yet. So the interactions are about to hit. Um, cool. Okay, so the second source photon is now about to uh, enter the medium under this, uh, into this EIT configuration. And we're interested to find out how this R state affects it. But that's the problem we just solved, right? Uh, the only difference between the problem that we solved is that now this R state is spread out uh, over many atoms, as opposed to being uh, in one uh, atom that we know. Um, however, you know, still what takes place um, is that, um, um, right, um, what takes place is that because of the Rydberg Rydberg interactions between R and R prime, um, um, the stored, uh, you know, the stored gate photon or spin wave um, shifts the state R prime, destroying the AT transparency window for the source photon. And uh, for simplicity, let's assume that this blocking radius is large. So actually, we're going to assume what, what Michael, what you suggested. Uh, um, so, and we're going to assume it for simplicity. So suppose the blocking radius is so large that it doesn't matter, you know, whether this R, uh, whether this Ri atom is in the beginning of the medium or at the end of the medium, we assume that no matter where it is, the entire medium is blockaded. So this means the entire medium is blockaded. Um, and so, uh, uh, and I represent it by this color. And then this incoming photon sees this uh, resonant two level medium, the shift is too large. As, as you know, as Leo said, you know, the shift is so large this omega prime plays no role. We have a resonant two-level medium, and if optical depth is large, this photon is scattered. Um, um, and then what we can do after this is over, we can turn our control field omega back on, uh, convert this stored uh, Rydberg spin wave into a, uh, a polariton, and retrieve the gate photon. So, uh, so the conclusion, what happened now, is we precisely made this a single photon switch. So uh, the presence of this gate photon, which first got stored and then retrieved, resulted in the scattering of the source photon. Um, and if this uh, gate photon wasn't there, uh, then the source photon would have just gone through this transparent EAT medium. So that's exactly the switch that I described. OK, any questions? Maybe this is a. <laughs> This would sound like a silly question, but why do I need this switch when I can just have, I don't know, like an opaque wall coming through? That's also a switch. Right, right, exactly. So the reason why I want the switch is because now a single photon uh, can control, uh, you know, either one other photon or, in fact, an entire beam of photons. So, uh, you know, and that's that's powerful. So this is precisely what nonlinear optics is about, right? So I want a, a really weak pulse, maybe a single photon controlling a large laser. And that's in fact possible, you know, so if I were to store, uh, so if I did the storage now, I, I sent a, uh, I send a, a single photon on, but I could have sent uh, many photons and they would all get scattered. So this really one teeny, you know, little uh, single gate photon now caused the scattering of the entire thing. Um, and this allows you to, uh, you know, for example, if you're doing classical information processing, this allows you to do, uh, you know, it in a very kind of energy efficient way. Because just a little tiny signal controls a big signal. Um, yeah. And you can do things, sort of more interesting things. I mean, it won't be uh, kind of useful right now when we're on resonance because we'll lose the, the source photon anyway. But if we could do it sort of in a way that we don't lose it, um, then we could in principle even uh, create a uh, superposition of this gate photon and no gate photon. And then we'll have a superposition kind of, of uh, incoming source beam going through versus not going through. And this will be like some sort of a cat state, um, but I pro probably won't get to that. So, uh, you know, and you cannot quite make a superposition of having a wall and no wall. I mean, but essentially that's what it is. You know, you're able to create a superposition of a wall and no wall. 
Yeah. Excellent question. Not a silly question. Fantastic question. More questions. Sorry, and uh, sorry, a basic question. Um, so having this spin wave uh, in terms of you know where the where your Rydberg atom is, um, does it actually? I mean, you're not sure where the Rydberg atom is, but does it actually mean that you have uh, more? I mean, effectively more power in uh, in you know uh, deflecting the the incoming wave because because the way I see it is that you you actually have let's say a quantum state that you know that has some uncertainty in you know where your Rydberg atom is so you will have an uncertainty in where your incoming photon is if deflected from what point in the sample but yeah then, so actually yeah so excellent question power? right yeah so um right so i i'll partially answer this in the next slide um but at the moment there's no difference so uh so I assume that this block A radius, you know, I assume that a single Rydberg excitation, no, mat no matter where it is, it blockades the entire medium. So if I, if I knew where it was, suppose like as, you know, like right here, the effect would be the same. The entire medium is uh, blockaded. Uh, so this uncertainty of where it is, it neither hurts us nor helps us uh, at the moment. The entire medium is blockaded anyway. So, uh, no matter where it is. And if I had more of these Rydberg excitations, it would still be the same. The entire medium would still be blockaded. So uh, it's just completely blockaded. So it's just the resonant two level medium, which is you know a, a resonant two level medium. So um, Yi Cheng has a question. Yeah, how will the source omega prime affect the gate photon? You probably have mentioned that. Ah, right. So uh, I assumed for simplicity that this R and R prime are different. And so uh, this, uh, you know, they're sufficiently different that uh, uh, a photon omega, like a classical field omega prime that's resonant with this ER prime transition is off resonant from the ER transition. And I want them to not affect each other. Yeah, I'm not sure I mentioned that, but that's the assumption. Thank you for the question. Yeah. So I want this R to be stationary and not affected by omega prime. I had a question as well. Yeah. Um, what's related to this, um, not knowing where the Rydberg excitation is, I can imagine two scenarios. Either this, um, this source pulse um, is scattered off, you don't know where it's, where it's from which, from where inside the medium it's scattered. So it's kind of in a superposition of being scattered from different positions within the medium. Or the other scenario I could imagine is that the scattering event is like a classical measurement and you therefore collapse the, the spin wave, wave function onto a single excitation. So that's exactly next slide. So I don't know if you've seen the next slide, but that's oh, what no. I'm about to talk about. <laughs> so, uh, so, here, so here I'm assuming, I'm assuming again that the entire medium is blockaded by, the, uh, by uh, a Rydberg excitation, no matter where it is. So the scattering here always happens right here uh, at the boundary. Uh, because uh, you know, I assume everything is blockaded. So the effect on the medium is the same independently of where the Rydberg atom is. But in the next slide, I will exactly address your question. So, so hold on uh, for just one second. Any more questions on, on this? Um, okay, okay, good. So we went through this, uh, right. So now let's exactly uh, study Yakov's question. So suppose now the block A radius is not the full medium. Suppose the block A radius is smaller than the length of the medium. So if the block A radius is smaller, we have a little bit of a problem. Uh, the problem is as follows. So, uh, so consider again, this uh, stored uh, um, uh, gate uh, spin wave that scatters our source photon. So the scattering, you know, exactly as Yakov said, the scattering can now happen um, inside the medium, not just at the boundary. It can happen inside the medium, anywhere inside the medium. And furthermore, the environment actually knows exactly where the source photon got scattered. Um, and since the source photons get scattered at the boundary of the blockaded region, remember this picture, it always scatters at the boundary if the uh, medium is sufficiently optically thick. So it means that the gate excitation, in fact, must be sitting exactly one block A radius ahead. So boom. So the environment knows the photon got scattered here. 
So it means that the Rydberg excitation that caused the scattering must sit basically exactly the one block air radius ahead. Um, so this means that the scattering of the source photon destroys this nice smooth spin wave by localizing the gate excitation right here. Um, so the environment knows where uh, the excitation is. So instead of having this nice superposition, uh, the environment knows where it is, but we don't know where it is, but we end up getting just the mixture. Uh, so this nice superposition of these different positions uh, of where the red bay excitation is becomes a mixture. Uh, and because it's a mixture and not a superposition, if we now try to uh, turn on the uh, uh, it's localized excitation, if we now try to turn on this uh, gate uh, control field to retrieve it, we actually will not be able to retrieve it. So uh, uh, the retrieval actually uh, relies on the fact that it's a nice smooth excitation. Uh, so kind of in, a, in frequency space or momentum space, it's narrow and it can be retrieved. But if it's a localized excitation, it has a high frequency components that don't fit in the EIT window and they cannot be retrieved. Um, so instead, this is not retrieved and it gets scattered. So Jakob, does this answer your question? That's exactly what you asked and even answered during your question. Pretty amazing. I don't know, maybe you were peeking uh, ahead and looking at the slides uh, there. Uh, <laughs> I was not, but thank you. Yes, it's not, oh, that's amazing. OK, <laughs> okay yeah, that's, that was an entire paper. Um, OK. Is the sending of the photon equivalent to doing a measurement as we lose the superposition information? Well, it's, it's, um, it's a measurement, but by the environment, because uh, we don't keep track of, uh, you know, uh, we don't keep track of where this photon got scattered. Like the environment knows, but we don't know. So the environment indeed measures, the, measures where it got scattered. If we were able to catch this photon, we could figure out where it came from. And then it'll be a measurement of where the R prime excitation is. But because we don't keep track of where the scattered photon came from or went, uh, we need to trace over all possible places uh, where it got scattered from. And that's why it's not a measurement. It's just a dephasing of this coherent spin wave. Um, so we lose all the uh, off-diagonal components and we just get a diagonal uh, a mixture here. Does that answer your question, uh, Jugal? Yes, thank you. Okay, excellent. More questions? No? Okay. So let's try uh, to turn this bug actually into a useful feature. Um, and uh, to do this, let's suppose actually we have several uh, gate spin waves that are stored in the medium. You know, I assume that I stored a single gate spin wave. Let's assume I have uh, several of them. So it means I have many of these Rydberg excitations. So in that case, you know, the physics that we just discussed will cause the localization of the first one of them, but these photons will never get to the second and the third one. Uh, so it means that uh, this first uh, spin wave, it protects all the uh, subsequent spin, wa spin waves uh, from localization. Uh, so it means that uh, we will not be able to retrieve that first guy, but we'll be able to retrieve uh, all the guys after it. Uh, and what this is actually, um, right, so all of the subsequent photons will just be scattered exactly at the same place. Um, so what this implements actually a single photon subtractor. So when we retrieve the spin wave, that first one got localized, it cannot be retrieved, but these other guys are, are still uh, nicely spread out and they're nice and coherent and they can be retrieved. Um, so what we did is we implemented a subtractor on the gate photons, we subtracted one photon. And such single photon subtractors, they can actually, uh, if you put them one after the other, they can be used as photon number resolving detectors uh, because we can be subtracting photons one by one. And we subtracted three times and there is nothing left. It means there were three photons there. So this is a single photon subtractor. Any questions? No. Okay. Well, only 20 more minutes left. You can do it, guys. You can do it. I know it's morning. Um, and in, in Boulder, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's 10, I guess. Yeah. And we started at like nine. Okay. Um, and if some of you are in California, you start at eight. Uh, and if some of you are somewhere else, well, it's probably worse. So, um, 
You can do it. 20 more minutes. Okay. So, and recently, actually, just a few months ago. This night so, in yeah. Beijing. So uh, thanks, everyone, for staying awake. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Well, thank you for those of you here in Beijing. Um, right. Um, so, so just, uh, you know, earlier this year, so uh, Sebastian Hoferberth also did this experiment. So he also did a, uh, a slightly different experiment where he uh, uh, did a multi-photon subtractor. So in one run, it subtracts several photons at a time. So uh, feel free to check that out. Okay, so moving on now to the, uh, probably the last thing that we will cover uh, is a uh, photon interacting with a stationary excitation, but now off resonance um, as opposed to on resonance. And we will show how this can be used to realize a uh, two photon quantum gate. Okay, so uh, first I'm gonna just repeat what I did uh, on resonance, but now I'll do it off resonance. Uh, and I'll just uh, emphasize the differences. So same thing, two states R and R prime, an incoming photon um, that uh, interacts uh, with this uh, uh, three level EIT system. The only difference now is that there's a large detuning delta. But as before, we assume that there is a single control atom uh, at uh, Z zero that's prepared in the state R prime, exactly the same thing. We just have a large detuning delta here. So as before, this atom at Z0 uh, shifts the state R uh, in a distance dependent way, um, like this. Um, and then uh, as before, far away from the Z0 atom, we have a transparent EIT medium. Remember, EIT is not really affected by this delta. It works pretty well. But now what is affected is that near this atom Z0, where the state R is shifted far away, where this omega has nothing to couple to, now instead of having a resonant two-level medium, we have an off-resonant two-level medium. And this is sort of related to what everybody was asking about. Leo was asking about, Grace was asking about it. So now uh, when we have this excitation around it, instead of creating an absorbing medium, we create an off-resonant two-level medium. Um, and we will, in a minute, define again this off-resonant block here, radius RB, that defines the size of this off-resonant two-level medium. And as we will see in a second, you know, uh, uh, this off-resonant two-level medium, instead of scattering the photon, it will imprint a phase on it, which now starts smelling now uh, as, an, uh, as a gate. Um, but let's derive it. Um, so any questions on the setup? It's the same setup as before, except now there's a larger tuning delta here. No? Okay. So we do the same thing. We Fourier transform you know, our E, P, and S, and we get our equations. Same equations as before, except now we ignore gamma because I assume delta is large, um, uh, but everything else is the same. So I replace minus gamma P with I delta P. And now, as before, I can solve this now uh, at omega equal to zero. I can solve for the field at z equal to L, I solve for the field at the output in terms of the field at the input, and I solve it at zero frequency, at zero little omega. Uh, and I get a very similar expression to before, except now instead of plus I gamma here, I have plus delta. That's all. That's the only difference. And exactly the same story holds. So when C6 is zero, that is, we have no interaction. So when V is zero, we have perfect transmission and there's no phase that is picked up. That's EIT. When C6 is infinite now, uh, the entire medium is blockaded by this red excitation. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, this, uh, this, this uh, V is so large that it makes this uh, uh, omega squared negligible. So we drop this omega squared um, and uh, uh, Vs cancel. And we get, uh, you know, I D gamma over delta. So it means that because of the propagation through this off resonant two level medium, the incoming photon picks up a phase of D gamma over delta. Uh, Garrett, this might be a bad question, but does it make sense to talk about the phase of a single photon? Ah, very good. Yes. So uh, 
if uh, if it's just if this is everything we have, it's not interesting. But if, for example, um, our our atom at r prime it was in superposition of being an r prime and g, then the r prime piece would imprint a phase on the single photon, but the g piece will not. So uh, so that's one possibility. Um, Another possibility is we can imagine that this incoming single photon is in a superposition of going through the medium and going around the medium. Then the part that goes through the medium would get a phase picked up, but the part that goes around the medium doesn't. So yeah, it definitely makes sense. Um, and you can think of it as a qubit. Suppose uh, you, know, uh, you have a dual rail qubit. You have a single photon that's either going through the medium, that's like the zero state of your qubit, or it goes around the medium, that's like the one state of your qubit. And then the zero picks up a phase and the one doesn't. So it's like, a, like it can be a Z gate on your qubit. Uh, okay, excellent. So Garrett says, I see uh, Anand, go for it. Um, I had a question from probably a long time ago uh, that I just realized now. Uh, so what's the distinction between um, capital delta and omega over here? They both look like a single photon detuning. Oh yeah, right. So, um, so yeah, so let's forget about the shift for a second. Suppose there's, I mean, there are like three shifts, so it's very confusing. But suppose there's no shift. Suppose the R state is down here. Um, so you can think of delta as a single photon detuning and little omega as a two photon detuning. Yeah, and we usually assume that delta is either zero or large. In this slide, it's large. So if delta is large, uh, then little omega is usually uh, either zero or much smaller than delta. Um, I see. And um, back in the earlier lectures, when we talked about um, EIT as like a filter, the omega there could have just as well been delta, right? Or omega um, could have been delta. Um, or I guess like no. So right. So the idea is that uh, you know, so EIT works. Let's suppose again this R state is right here. Forget about the shift B. So mm -hmm. if little omega is zero, we have EIT independently of whether delta is large or zero. So EIT works for both large and zero delta. And in both cases, if we now shift our little omega a little bit away from zero, we destroy EIT. So uh, on resonance, the destruction created a resonant two-level medium and an off resonance for large delta, this created an off resonant two-level medium. I see, I see. Okay, thanks. Thank you. More questions? No? Okay. So again, I'm just repeating the same exercise as before, but now, you know, this, this uh, Z0 excitation, um, if it were blocking the entire medium, we would pick up this phase D gamma over delta. Uh, so it's an off resonant two level medium of length L and optical depth D that causes the scattering and not scattering this phase, excuse me. And uh, for a general C6, the same story as before. If omega squared is smaller, uh, sorry, if V is smaller than omega squared over delta, V doesn't matter. And we get, you know, a perfect EIT, this transparent medium. And if V is greater than omega squared over delta, then we can ignore uh, this omega squared here. And we have the off resonant two level medium. So off resonance, the block A radius is defined by this equation. So V of RB is equal to omega squared over delta. On resonance, it was omega squared over gamma, and now it's omega squared over delta. And this RB now separates uh, the transparent EIT medium uh, from this dark region, you know, where we have an off resonant uh, two level medium. And again, we have this blockaded optical depth. And uh, this means that uh, this R prime excitation at Z zero imprints a phase of gamma divided by delta times the blockaded optical depth. And if we can tune this uh, phase uh, dB gamma over delta to be pi, this will be, you know, uh, this will be uh, uh, putting a phase pi on our photon. And this would allow us, for example, to uh, entangle the, uh, the atom with the photon if, if one of them were in a uh, superposition state, exactly as I described early in response to uh, uh, Garrett's question. Questions? Sorry, is there an intuitive picture for, to see why, you know, the, the effect of this delta is to, you know, not scatter the photon? I mean... Well, yeah, well, that's, I mean, this is what we, uh, yeah, this was probably in one of the first lectures, right? 
forget about, you know, forget about um, uh, this R state completely, you know, forget about this omega. Suppose you just have a two level medium. Um, I mean, what happens is that if this capital delta is large, we basically never populate this E state. Um, we just off resonant from it, we never populate it. And so this gamma, which is the decay of the E state, I mean, it doesn't get a chance to act. So uh, uh, what happens is we just populate this E state only virtually. Um, and it's this virtual population of the E state that gives us the phase. Now, of course, this virtual population comes with a small scattering, but turns out the small scattering, I mean, it goes like one over delta squared while the phase goes as one over delta. So for large delta, the scattering is suppressed uh, more strongly than the phase. So you pick up a phase without scattering. I see, yes. Cool. More questions? Okay, 10 more minutes, guys. You can do it. Um, okay. So, so there are a lot of applications of this. Um, so um, in particular, if we're able to make this D gamma over delta, if we're able to make it pi, so one thing that I immediately allow us to do is to make an atom photon gate, right? So uh, suppose uh, I created this uh, atom here, not in state R prime, but in superposition of R prime and G, then the uh, G part of it uh, gives a completely transparent medium while the R prime part can pick up a phase pi. And this is a, a controlled phase gate now between an atom and a single photon. Awesome. Um, so, um, right, so let me in fact write this out. So uh, uh, we now just discussed the case if this phase is D gamma over delta, if it's equal to pi, then if our atom is prepared in state R prime and we have a single photon coming in, um, then we can get a phase pi if this D gamma over delta is pi. Now, if we either had no photon coming in or the photon came in and went around the medium, we would have no phase imprinted at all. Uh, similarly, if this R prime atom, instead of being in state R prime, it were in G, there would also be no phase uh, independently of whether we send the photon through the medium or didn't. And this is exactly a, you know, a two qubit uh, control phase gate. So you can see that it's very useful for quantum information processing. Um, now, there are two ways. Now, we were interested in photon-photon interactions, uh, but we just figured out how to do atom-photon interactions. So there are two ways uh, to uh, uh, convert this idea into a photon-photon gate. So one of them I'm not going to explain in detail, so you can uh, find this uh, PRL by Duan and Kimball from 2004, where you prepare this single atom in a superposition you know, of, of G and R prime, then you scatter the first photon from this atom. Then you rotate this atom. You scatter the second photon of this atom. And then you measure the atom. And it turns out because that same uh, atom scattered two different photons and it got entangled with both of them, after we measure it, it turns out we can implement a gate between two photons. So I mean, I'm not explaining the details because uh, you know, I want to uh, explain the second method. Um, but this can already uh, be used to make a gate between two photons, where this one atom mediates interaction between two photons that are sub subsequently uh, kind of iteratively scattered from it. Now, the thing that is maybe easier to understand that I will explain is that we can make a photon-photon gate using storage and retrieval, uh, which I, I have explained, storage and retrieval. So what we do is uh, we store the control photon as an R prime spin wave. Um, and if we assume that this uh, R prime spin wave blockades the entire medium, um, then we just run the target photon through, um, you know, uh, as, as, explained, uh, as explained here. If uh, D gamma over delta is equal to pi, it picks up a phase pi. And then we retrieve the control photon. And this implements the gate between the control photon and the target photon. And this was done, in fact. So this was done uh, by Gerhard Rempe um, uh, and, um, and his team. Um, 
so the, the another sort of uh, leading author there is Dewar. Um, so they first uh, did it just for like a single photon and then they did it in fact for a superposition of uh, sort of one photon that's interacting and one photon that's not interacting. So it's been done beautifully. And this is the similar gate by Jeff Thompson, Misha Lukin and uh, Vlad Bulatic where they use this uh, uh, flip-flop interaction that uh, uh, somebody, maybe Tian Rui, I think um, uh, mentioned. Um, and there's another sort of related uh, work here. But this is how you do the photon photon gate. And this is, you know, uh, that's what we were after. So any questions on this slide? So Alexei, I'm not really sure how to make this question precise, but to make all these gates and things useful and work somehow, I guess you want to do more than just shine them in a cloud and then they're gone forever. I, is it easy to capture all the photons coming out, you know, to not just lose photons? Um, well, I mean, here they're not lost. I mean, so imagine, um, I mean, imagine you're doing some, uh, you know, quantum computing with photons, right? I mean, you have some uh, network of beam splitters and phase shifters. So you can imagine doing it using kind of using linear optics quantum computing where, you know, you make these measurements and, you know, herald it on the measurements, you do something, so you can just do that. But it's not very efficient. It requires a lot of, you know, ancillas and stuff. Um, so then you can replace some of your beam splitters. You can replace with this, uh, you know, uh, with this uh, two photon nonlinear gate. Um, so you need a network of photons that go through and interact with, you know, like these two photons interact and those two photons interact and then it works, yeah. Um, but I mean, so I guess that's kind of what I'm getting at that, you know, with a beam splitter or with uh, fibers or even free space propagation, you know, everything's pretty collimated and stays really nice. Is that also the case here? You don't get weird? Yes. Uh, no, uh, no, it's, you get nothing. I mean, that's the beauty of this EIT. Everything, you know, uh, like uh, if your optical depth is sufficiently large, um, then the storage and retrieval, you know, doesn't really uh, doesn't really affect anything. Uh, either transfers to longitudinally the same photon that you got in, it comes out, you know, uh, with whatever inefficiency your storage and retrieval has. Um, and uh, when this uh, target photon goes through, again, nothing is affected. So it is exactly like that. Yeah, you don't lose anything. You don't need to collimate. Everything is beautiful. And it was, you know, kind of demonstrated, uh, you know, uh, here uh, in these papers. Okay, more questions? I mean, we're pretty much done, so. Um... Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, so I, I was gonna, let's see, oh, applications, right. So uh, so exactly as Caden said, so if you could implement, uh, you know, this photon-photon gate, you can use it to do a uh, photonic quantum computing uh, based on nonlinear optics as opposed to based on linear optics and this, uh, uh, quantum computing based on nonlinear optics is more efficient than the one that's based on um, uh, linear optics. Um, you can also do a quantum networking, um, which you know is a convenience. So normally in these quantum networks, maybe you need to convert your photons, uh, you know, to matter, and then you do some gates between you know uh, two matter qubits. But here, you know, uh, you know, you can uh, do gates in some sense directly be between photons. I mean, it's not quite true. We still do some storage but at least this photon doesn't have to be stored. It just runs through. Um, so it's also useful for quantum networking. And really that's it. So I think I will just stop here. So, uh, and I'll just briefly to tell you, I mean, there's, there'll, be, there'll be very little difference between uh, this section that we're not going to get to dynamics of multiple photons and interactions with stationary excitations. If you have two photons, What's going to happen is very similar to a photon with stationary excitation. You know, uh, one of the photons will create either an absorbing two-level medium on resonance or a uh, refractive, you know, uh, two-level medium off resonance for the second photon. And you get the same thing. You know, you can get a, a two-photon gate uh, or on resonance, you can get, turns out, a source of single photons, but I'm not going to discuss that. It's very similar. I mean, something that's non-trivial that I will not discuss is if you're off resonance, um, you can basically get a medium of interacting dark state polaritons and you can write, you know, a many body uh, field theory for them. Um, and you can study it in the same way in which you study many body physics of electrons. So now it will be a Hamiltonian describing many body physics of uh, these uh, polaritons, which are bosons. Um, and that's exciting. And you can study whatever. You can study topological phases of them. You can study, uh, 
you know, crystals of them. Um, there are some proposals on this, um, you know, and there are even some experiments. So John Simon, you know, demonstrated this uh, Laughlin state of uh, uh, photons uh, using basically ideas that are very similar to this, except in a, in a cavity. So that's it. Um, um, okay, a question here about the subtractor. How do you actually retrieve the others while the first one is scattering the incoming photons? Okay, let me go back. Um, right. Okay, so after we uh, do the scattering of the source photons, then we're done. Um, and then uh, the state of the gate uh, spin waves that we have here is that one gate spin wave has been defased, it's localized, and the other gate spin waves are not defased. And so if we just turn on this uh, RE control field to try to retrieve uh, you know, everything that's stored in this GR transition, that's just what's going to happen. You know, the things that are defased, uh, this guy will not get retrieved because it has large frequency components. It's narrow in position space and it's narrow in time space and wide in frequency space. It's wide in momentum space. It's not going to fit in the EIT transparency window. Um, but these other guys that have not been defaced, uh, they'll be retrieved in exactly the same way in which they were stored. So nothing special. You just turn on this control field and these two guys come out and this one doesn't. Okay. Um, I guess you didn't mention this, uh, but if I have, if I consider two photons, say coming in from two sides, yes, then is the picture correct that they would come in and they would, I guess, scatter off in random directions, sort of like two electrons scattering off each other. Right. So it depends on whether you do this. Uh, it depends on whether you do this on resonance or off resonance. So uh, on resonance, uh, basically, uh, I mean, one of them will get scattered actually, and the other one will go through. Turns out, um, but it's not as much fun as off resonance. So what's going to happen off resonance is they're actually just going to imprint a phase on each other, um, and it just gives you a gate. It turns out this gate just doesn't work as well as a uh, as the one that you know, I explained kind of in these slides here. Um, um, yeah, it doesn't work as well as this, uh, but uh, but it's still a gate. You know, they just go through each other. It's beautiful. Um, yeah. More questions? Uh, this might be. This is a more open-ended question, but can one? Try to use these grid breaks in the three level systems to uh, actually try and do generation of single photons. My impression that single photon generation is still like a tough problem. Is there any? Yes, yes, yes. So I was gonna, yes, I was gonna cover that. So, uh, but you know, I didn't get to it. So if you, um, 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 I mean, this has been done. I mean, not quite in the way that uh, I'm gonna say now. Um, uh, but um, right. So um. Let's see. Um, yeah, so what can happen is basically, uh, let's see, right. So here I said that suppose we have an excitation here and then other excitations come in and they get scattered. But suppose there's nothing here to begin with. And we just send a bunch of photons coming in. So it turns out the first photon that comes in, it basically creates such an excitation. And all the subsequent photons get scattered. So this creates a single photon source. Um, so you basically send in a coherent pulse in. Um, and out of every, uh, you know, Fox state of this coherent pulse, you pick out one photon that creates this, uh, you know, uh, polariton and it goes through, but all the subsequent photons just scatter off. Um, so it exactly allows you to make a single photon. Now that's not how people actually do it with Rydberg atoms. The way you do it is you actually, you try to excite basically, uh, from the side, uh, off resonance, you try to excite and ex excite your atom from G to R. And if there are strong interactions between these R states, you can only excite a single one. And you excite a single one, and then you retrieve it. Uh, and this works really well. So the most recent experiment was, was by Trey Porter and Steve Rolson. And they, uh, uh, and they created, you know, basically uh, one of the best single photon sources ever this way. Oh, that's really cool. So. Is, is that the first example of sort of like single photon generation on demand? 
or are there no, more? it's not the first example. Uh, so, um, um, there was a paper actually like a like a while ago. One of the first papers actually on this uh, um, on this uh, Rydberg EIT uh, physics was by uh, Alex Kuzmich and uh, is a student whose last name is Dudin. Um, so, uh, uh, and that's what they did. You know, uh, um, it didn't work as well as this most recent one. Uh, but yeah, it's, I mean, and there are lots of different, you know, a single photon sources or this quantum dot base that used to be very bad, but now they're getting better and better. Uh, so this, this single photon source that uh, Trey Porter and Steve Rolston made, the paper is called something like on demand, a uh, single photon source, something like this. Um, it's very good, uh, but it's not better than the uh, um, uh, uh, quantum dot source along all axes, like along some axes is better but along some axes, not as good. For example, I don't think it's as fast, um, uh, but yes, it's basically a deterministic single photon source, but it's not perfect. You know, uh, you know, there's still small admixtures of like two photon states, you know, uh, there's some small uh, probability of vacuum, you know, there are all of these imperfections, but they're all characterized there. So yes, I mean, that's a great pass to single photon sources. Yes, probably the best in my view. Thank you. Great. So, uh, I want uh, Alexei. Thank you again. We could probably have lots more questions, but we have our one-minute talks right now, so we have to keep things moving. Um, so, let's uh, thank Alexei for the really wonderful few lectures. Um, we're let's Thanks. take a five-minute break, so we'll reconvene. I guess Boulder time ten forty-one. Uh,